it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've kind of caught up with so many um, old friends um, uh, from my time when I was uh, either out here in uh, as an intern at the Rural Jubilee Hospital or when I was a uh, uh, gynae oncologist in Halifax. So it's, it's really like coming home and I, I really appreciate the welcome that everybody has um, given me. So I thought it might be interesting to uh, talk to you guys about the uh, National Gynae Oncology Registry, which is something that I've been uh, part of setting up. It's obviously not just me, it's a whole group of people that have done this, but um, it's been a, a work in progress, but we're finally um, um, getting some rewards for all of that. So I thought I might uh, talk to you about um, uh, this won't move forward. For, oh, there it is. Um, uh, about the clinical quality register, why we thought it was important, uh, what exactly it does, uh, how we got it going, and um, I guess most importantly, including the mistakes that we made. Uh, and uh, I always thought, say to my registers, you know, you must always learn from your mistakes, but it's actually better to learn from other people's mistakes. So I'm hoping that if I talk to you guys about it and you think that this might be something worthwhile for you to pursue, that you'll uh, take a few lessons from from us uh, in that regard. And also a little bit about what the future holds for us. Um, so I think uh, like it's really important in this day and age um, that, we, they, that we look at our surgical outcomes. Uh, quality of care is important. Um, those who are involved in, in giving the care and those who are uh, involved in receipt of the care really wanna know that they're getting the best care possible. And um, especially with uh, increasing demand and decreasing resources, we have to know that we are providing the best care that we can. Um, and so ultimately, quality care is a value judgment, which reflects the values of the healthcare system, but also the values of um, the society at large. And, and they may be different from uh, country to country or place to place. Um, if we're going to use targets, we have to be, uh, the targets need to be smart. That means they have to be specific, they have to be measurable, they have to be achievable, they have to be result oriented, and they have to be timely. And you can use these targets to establish baseline information, um, to benchmark against peers, to set standards and priorities, find out what you're doing well and what you're not doing well, and maybe what you need to change, and of course, inform quality improvement. But this doesn't come you know, easily. Um, it requires a lot of time, effort, and resources. And I'll take you through what, what we did and how we did it. So we do know that variations in care exist. Um, this is an old publication from way back when, uh, 20 years ago, um, where we uh, a patterns of care a study was done in Victoria, which is one of our states, not Victoria, the um, city. And that they found that a third of women with ovarian cancer had suboptimal care, uh, both in the form of the surgery and uh, the medical oncologists weren't off the hook either. Uh, chemotherapy was given inappropriately as well. And, Although things have improved over the last 20 years, there, we know that anecdotally there is still plenty of room for improvement. Um, it's not just Australia that has difficulties. When there was a publication in The Lancet in 2011, um, we saw that there were significant variations in the one and five year survival in ovarian cancer patients across several jurisdictions in several countries. You'll be pleased to see that regardless, Canada seemed to have come out on the top, but I would say that there should be some caution in inter interpreting data across countries because of uh, differences in healthcare systems, in ascertainment, in uh, incidence, in uh, you know gen genetic differences as well. So, you know that sort of says to us that what we need is a is a uniform system um, of comparing um, outcomes, uh, and that's really what a quality uh, registry, clinical quality registry, does. Um, what do we know about current ovarian cancer care in Australia? Well, there's something called the AOCS, which is the Australian Ovarian Cancer Study, which uh, ran from about 2004, I think, to 2008, which collected data on 1,800 um, ovarian cancer patients across the country um, and is really a rich source of data because it has not only the um, uh, it has clinical data that's associated with pathologic data and, um, uh, and other data. So we've used that to, to get a lot of information about and, and have a, a, a countrywide picture of what's going on. So from the AOC 
CS data, we found that there were variations in chemotherapy. You were less likely to get chemo if you're older than 70 and more likely to get single agent chemo. Um, in total, less than 70% of patients got combination carbotaxel and only 50% completed treatment without dose reduction or delay. Um, when we looked at the AOC da AOCS data regarding surgery, um, we saw that only 68% um, had lymph node sampling in early uh, um, epithelial ovarian cancer. And we also found that there was inequity of access and that remoteness, socioeconomic disadvantage and comorbidities were all associated with poor outcomes. So, um, you know, there's some evidence that we're not doing that well in terms of equity, surgery or chemotherapy. Um, and, you know, I'm very grateful to Amy and to Jessica and to all the people in the group that um, nicely published this uh, work just in time for my talk, which shows that it's no different in Canada. Um, and this is reflecting in the endometrial cancer care, uh, which obviously is the impetus of having an objective system like the PROMISE uh, classification. But there's um, var variation in practice, which one can only assume will um, result in variations in outcomes as well. So um, how do we approve outcomes in ovarian cancer? Um, well, we have control over more things than we realize, and it's, yeah, it'll be a shock to surgeons to find out that it's not all about um, surgery. Uh, it's much more than that. It's, it, it's, it's important that all of us that are involved in the care of women with endometrial cancer or with gynae cancer in general um, uh, are involved in, in quality care. So it's not just surgical staging and debulking. We obviously have to have correct pathologic diagnosis. Uh, we have to have select appropriate patients for BRCA testing. We have to optimize chemotherapy, identify high risk and low risk uh, patients. We obviously need to have uh, access to clinical trials, but also um, supportive care during and after treatment prevention, secondary surgery, optimal management and recurrence uh, setting, timing of treatment and avoiding over-treatment and under-treatment. So it's more than just the surgery. And I think that's what we, we came to realize when we were um, putting together our um, uh, clinical quality indicators is that it wasn't all gonna be about surgery. So what is a clinical quality registry? Well, it's, um, it collects uniform data to measure a performance of either a practitioner or a health service, or you know, if it's international, a, 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 a nation, um, a country, about, against a range of agreed clinical quality indicators. And the important thing is that it has to be an agreed um, clinical quality indicators. And so everybody has to develop what they think is important for them, for their patients, for their hospital, for their province, for their uh, country. Um, it has to be risk adjusted. So, um, you know, one hospital might get all the, the lean young patients and another hospital may get all the old uh, obese patients. And obviously uh, comparisons between those two hospitals uh, need to be risk adjusted and benchmarked. Um, and what it does is it um, empowers health service providers to improve patient care and outcomes. So if you find that at your hospital, you are, have got um, a below average uh, indicator, then it would be a powerful uh, piece of information to give to your um, uh, health service providers about how things should be improved and uh, a way uh, potentially of going to those uh, hospitals who appear to be doing it well and say, what are you guys doing different that, that we could um, learn from? And then it gets back into the whole quality improvement cycle, which is not just a one-off thing. Uh, it's, you know, you collect data, you risk adjust it, you provide feedback, you um, assess the outliers, you make improvements to the system, and that results in better care and improved uh, patient outcome, and then the whole cycle begins again. Um, I, um, I think we, I think I've got here outlier assessment, and we actually don't use the word outlier because that has a somewhat derogatory term, we, we use the word unwarranted variation. So there might be warranted variation because one hospital is dealing with very um, sick patients, but if there's unwarranted variation, which is why it's so important to uh, provide risk adjusted data. So um, 
if you're going to do quality assurance, it has to be sensitive. And what that means is that you have to have every patient or almost every patient. So this cannot be an opt in system. It has to be an opt out system um, so that you get 90 to 95% of all patients. Because if you're only collecting data on 50% or 70% of patients, you're not going to have the, the sensitivity that you need. I talked about detection of our unwarranted variation in, co uh, in care. And it can be an early warning system for problems in care. If we providing this data on a yearly or a um, two yearly basis, it, it is much quicker than, I don't know what, what your um, uh, outcomes that are published by the national um, uh, cancer registries are, but for us, they're five years out of date. So uh, it's a slow, um, that's not quick. So we want this early warning system. And there's no doubt that, you know, if you're told that you are underperforming, um, you know, doctors are kind of competitive people and they want to, to be the best and do the best, it certainly would be an impetus to improve patient care. And we're hoping that this will also be the inspiration for and the platform for research projects that questions will come out of all of this and, and, and people will want to embark on research projects because there will be a, a rich a database of information. Um, it's a way of bringing clinicians together and stimulating collaboration. And ultimately we want it to um, improve the care of women and um, help implement systemic change. So I just wanted to give you some examples from the prostate cancer registry that has been um, uh, up and running in Victoria. A, that is the state of Victoria since 2012. And they, um, the information that we get is given in this funnel plot with the, the average, um, the first one standard deviation and two standard deviations. And so this site here was identified as falling outside the two standard deviations of care um, in terms of a positive surgical margin rate. And so when they looked at it, there were some changes that, that needed to be made and um, pathology was reviewed and surgical training program was reviewed and there subsequently were cha changes. And they also um, found that there was uh, subsequently a, there was an adherence to um, a, a better adherence to guidelines for low risk cases. And there's also a Victoria Lung Cancer Registry, which, um, which identified differences in the timings of care in public versus private hospitals, which I know is not a, an issue in Canada, but it's a big issue in um, in uh, Australia. So um, clinical quality indicators um, have to be, um, they can be outcome uh, indicators, they can be um, process indicators, or they can be structural indicators. So I'll go through of these and just, and just give you an idea about what we're talking about. So the outcome indicators are, uh, relate to the recovery um, and restoration of functionality and survival of patients. So they're a pretty hard end point. Um, so they're easy to measure um, and they're certainly valid as a dimension of safety and quality, but they're a little bit difficult to use as direct measures of safety and quality because um, of the patient factors that I've spoken about before, i.e. do you have very healthy patients in one center and, and very unhealthy patients in the other center? And so, um, an example of this would be 30 and 90 day post-surgical mortality. It's a clinical outcome. Or it could be a patient reported outcome. You could say the percentage of patients who report severe pain at you know, two weeks post-surgery or whatever. So those are, those are pretty hard endpoints, um, but don't always directly relate to the safety and quality of care that's, that's given, but can do. Um, process indicators measure the extent of the application of good health care. Um, and so um, usually in reference to uh, standards that are um, set guidelines and standards, they're usually more sensitive to differences in quality than outcome measures and can be easier to interpret. So um, if we say the standard is that all patients should have a um, confirmed histologically confirmed diagnosis prior to starting chemotherapy, then that's a pretty hard endpoint um, that you can use. Um, and the third one is structural indicators. And that's, the, that's things like um, adequacy of facilities and equipment. You know, is there a gynae oncologist on staff? Um, is the 
uh, does the hospital or healthcare system provide uh, enough um, infrastructure for you to do um, the work? These are easy to collect, but not always easy to clearly link with patient outcomes. So an example of this would be the number of primary ovarian cancer surgeries performed by gynae oncologists. So um, in about 2015, and we talked about in, in the Australian Society of Gynae Oncologists, we talked about this off and on for many years about how we wanted to have a surgical clinical quality um, registry that we wanted to measure how well we were uh, delivering surgical care. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Rob Rome, who's a gynae oncologist in, um, in Melbourne really ran with this and got us together when we all said we didn't have time and we had other things on our mind. He just said, he kept on and on and said, we need to do this. So we established a working group of clinical experts that gynae oncologists, radiation and medical oncologists who, who wanted to be involved in this. We conducted a literature review um, and we subsequently convened, convened meetings of each working group. We started with the ovarian cancer because that seemed like the easiest one to do to define a set of key quality indicators. Um, and we subsequently expanded that to other uh, tumor sites. And then I think the really important thing is that we really needed to um, pilot the data um, uh, to make sure that these cl clinical quality indicators were um, correct. And um, we learned some lessons pretty quickly about that. So these are the ones that we came up with in 2017. And you have to have a reasonable number, but you can't go overboard. And so we chose some things that we thought were important, like appropriate staging, um, present presentation at, at MDT meeting, uh, histologic or cytologic confirmation prior to chemotherapy, um, first line therapy, which is platinum based, um, debulking surgery and the extent of residual disease, whether it be primary debulking or uh, interval debulking, um, we wanted to look at complications, we wanted to look at adverse events post-surgery, and then we wanted to look at um, genetic testing. So um, those are the ones we started with. Um, we had minimal funding. Um, we had some money from uh, ASGO, uh, Australian Society of Gynae Oncologists, I think $50,000. The CAS Foundation is a philanthropic group that gave us some money, and Ovarian Cancer Australia, which is a consumer-led group also gave us some money. Um, we had to get ethics approval for this from each site. And uh, we started out with 10 public and private hospitals in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania, but ended up, um, I think, only having seven hospitals which who co collected enough data that we could use it in the initial pilot stage. We had to, it, this was a problem. Uh, um, ethics committees are used to having opt-in um, ethics approval and an opt-out ethics approval is was seemed to many of them a step too far and it required a lot of um, persuasion to say that this whole thing was uh, pointless unless we had an opt-out uh, system. Um, because we had limited resources, uh, we decided that we were going to utilize the existing databases that many of the units had and unfortunately we found out that the individual unit databases were not compatible. And so what we ended up doing is downloading the information onto an Excel spreadsheet and then sending it to the central registry um, and having them collate the information. The problem with that is that this is all added work for the unit data managers if they had one and if they didn't then it was added work for somebody else. And although we said that those nine um, clinical quality indicators were really important, they were not routinely collected in every site. So that um, meant that in some cases, there was a large amount of missing data. Anyway, we pressed on because we thought we've made a start. We've got some money. We really need to keep going. Um, but you know, there were problems with, uh, as I've said, incomplete data sets, um, incomplete patient ascertainment, delay in sending data. We, quickly realized that some of the CQIs were not appropriately defined. And importantly, the comorbidity information was not routinely collected. And I've gone on and on about why we need that for benchmarking. Um, so um, I received the first report in 2019 and it was de-identified except your own site was, um, was identified. And of course, you can imagine, I was very pleased with this um, 
with this result because obviously we're first on the top of the leaderboard, which is where I always want to be. Everyone says I'm just a tad competitive. Um, so that was great. We were doing well. 100% of patients were discussed in NDT before, uh, during which a treatment plan was made. Um, this was not so great. So what happened here is that according to this registry, only 4.5% of our early um, ovarian tubal and peritoneal cancer patients were appropriate stage, which I didn't believe, but um, that's what the registry said. And you, if you go back, you'll remember what the first CQI was. It was the longest of them all. And there were all these points where interpretation could be made because what you've got to remember is the people putting the information into the registry are not doctors, they are coders. And so there was too much in here, room for interpretation. So where clinically apt, uh, applicable, mucinous tumors only, if fertility preservation is not a priority. So all of those things had to be interpreted. And I suspect what happened was it was not interpreted correctly. Um, we did well on patients receiving platinum-based chemotherapy. Um, we did well on um, optimal debulking. Um, we did very well in uh, intraoperative complication. Um, we didn't do so well with uh, post-operative uh, um, adverse events within 30 days of surgery. And according to the registry, um, over 70% of our patients had either death, unplanned return to theater, ICU or CCU admission or hospital readmission. And another 10% had all of those other um, complications, which uh, it, the problem is, is that that was poor, poorly um, um, collected data and, and not benchmarked. And I really don't think that was, was correct. So, like I said, uh, the problems with this is that with incomplete data sets, no BMI in, in almost half the patients, no ECOG in a third of the patients, no stage in 13% of the patients. So it could not be, um, it could not be benchmarked. Uh, we were pretty sure that we weren't getting all the patients. Um, the clinical quality indicators, as I said, were often um, not appropriately or incompletely um, defined. Um, and the comorbidity information uh, was only collected in about uh, less than 10% of patients. So um, fast forward to April, 2022, and what's happened since then? Well, a, a number of things have happened. Um, we have refined the epithelial ovarian and tubal and peritoneal cancer module and refined the CQIs on the basis of um, the feedback from the first um, episode. We've now recruited uh, 1500 patients um, and we're really quite fully operational there. Um, we have completed the endometrial cancer uh, module CQIs and have and are piloting them in two sites um, and have recruited uh, just over a thousand patients. And we've um, developed a rare ovarian cancer non-epithelial module and um, have recruited 130 patients to that in the pilot phase. Um, we've got 25 sites approved in Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania, South Australia and, West, uh, and Western Australia. You will notice, I don't know if you can follow my marker here or not, but this amounts to about 60% geographically of um, Australia, uh, and uh, but about 80% of the population lives in these areas. So I'm not saying we've got 80% of the population, but we've got access to 80% of the population. The big outlying areas are Northern Territory, which did not have a gynae oncologist for a long time and has just had one now, and Queensland, who were kind of doing their own system a little bit, but I think we're going to persuade them to come on to, um, to this, uh, this registry. So, um, so it's a work in progress, but we're getting there. And these are the um, hospitals that are involved. So there's a fair number, there's a fair amount of work to get everybody here uh, on board uh, through ethics and ready to go. Uh, this is obviously not all the hospitals in uh, Australia, but it's most of the hospitals and where a gynae oncologist would be doing work. And it includes both public and private hospitals. So that's great. So um, what's happening with us? So we've got two areas that um, we're working on. One is the ovarian cancer registry and um, it's 
uh, looks after the core ovarian tubal and peritoneal cancer. But as I mentioned before, we've got a rare tumor module as well. And we've also got a patient reported outcome module as well that we're working on. Um, and the second part is the Epworth expansion project, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a few slides. So let's just go to the ovarian cancer registry module. So um, this came about as a result of a 3.5 million um, uh, uh, grant application that uh, was successful in 2020. And what we said we wanted to do, uh, and this is from the uh, federal government through the Medical uh, Research Fund. Um, and what we said we wanted to do was we wanted to increase clinical data collection and recruit a greater proportion of the Australian ovarian cancer population. And what we were doing, how we were doing that is we were giving the site some money to help with um, patient uh, data collection, which had been a big problem. Um, and we have said we would um, produce timely QR reports uh, that we can then uh, send uh, off to uh, both individual clinicians and to um, healthcare services. We're going to uh, measure quality of life with patients with ovarian uh, cancer by collecting patient reported outcomes and, and reporting this back to the health services and um, create a rare um, tumor submodule um, to recruit women with um, rare tumors. So we're at this uh, point now. Um, and so I'm gonna show you what, what now we've uh, had reported back to us. So um, this is data from 2017 to the end of 2020. Um, so that's when the patients were operated on and then it takes a little while for all the data to come through to us. And it's a total of 573 patients. If we're looking at the advanced um, OTP cancers, um, that was 573 patients. And so I'm going to look, give you the funnel plots for stage uh, three and four disease with either no residual disease at primary surgery or no residual disease at interval surgery. And so this is the proportion of patients with advanced OTP who underwent primary cytoreductive surgery. And so this is the uh, average, this line here, which was, if you recall, was about 46%. This is the one standard deviation, this is two standard deviation. So you can see here that most people are doing well, they're, um, they're um, meeting the uh, CQI requirement, but there's obviously an outlier here or there was, there's unwarranted vari variation here. And so this is an early warning system that maybe something is going wrong uh, here and that, that needs to be investigated. Um, and this is, proportion of patients with advanced OTP cancer who undergo interval cytoreductive surgery and have no macroscopic residual. Again, the percentage is about 44%. And um, again, there's another outlier. We have no idea if this is the same outlier as before or a different outlier because we only get told our sites. Um, but, and then there would be potentially a cause for concern there as well. Um, the other example I'm going to show you is one um, where we're looking at intraoperative events. And so the problem with intraoperative events is that there was um, no real grading system. And so an awful lot of free text um, was provided. Um, uh, oh, Diane's just arrived. Diane, I'm on a Zoom call doing a, a lecture to CQI. So anyway, she's, um, she's just... <laughs> <laughs> She's just arrived, but anyway, we'll keep going. Um, so the problem with this, you can see there's a few cases here that fall within the um, area that we want, um, but there's a few that fall out lie and, and we don't want free text. Free text makes it very difficult for the coders to really um, code things correctly. And so we need a classification system of intraoperative events. And, and that's something that we really feel that we need to work on. Um, Post-operative events um, was a little easy to, easier to collect because there's an, a grading system. And so we've encouraged people to use the Clavian Dindo uh, grading system. Um, and um, it avoided uh, freehand entry, which made it easier for the coders to figure out what was going on. And you can see that there's a much narrow window here and, and 
supposedly we have no unwarranted var variation there. Um, so the other part of the uh, NGOR is the Epworth Expansion Project, and it's uh, called the Epworth Expansion Project because it's made possible because of a phil philanthropic um, um, donation from the Epworth, uh, from Audrey Voss um, in the Epworth Medical Foundation. I I if we lived in Vancouver, it would be called the Audrey Voss Expansion Project, but we don't live in Vancouver. Um, and so this really was um, expanding from, from ovarian cancer to endometrial cancer, cervical cancer and vulvar cancer. Um, and we did the same thing that we did with the ovarian tumor site module, working groups, literature review, convene meetings to um, define the qual clinical quality indicators and then pilot them. So we're at a, a pilot phase now. And um, so these are the endometrial cancer clinical quality indicators. A lot of the stuff is the same, you know, is it discussed in MDT? Has appropriate imaging been done? Um, was a hysterectomy done as, as part of the primary treatment? Um, those are who are at high risk. Um, did they have surgical staging appropriately? Intraoperative vents, um, was the pathology right, uh, contain all the minimum required elements? Um, what were the adverse events? And then things that are kind of pertinent to endometrial cancer, such as adjuvant treatment. Um, our radiation oncologists were really keen to have a, a um, CQI about timeliness of radiotherapy because of the known uh, um, uh, problems with um, extending out the radiotherapy. Um, and then obviously genetic testing. And I really wanted to put in clinical trials. And so it had escaped the ovarian cancer one, but it's in the new one. And we put the clinical trials in as well. Um, cervical cancer, much of a muchness, MDT, appropriate imaging, appropriate surgery. We wanted to talk about negative surgical margins. Uh, we wanted a proper surgery report and pathology report. Again, adverse events. Um, those who have uh, platinum-based chemotherapy along with their radiotherapy as primary treatment, duration of radiotherapy, because we know that affects outcomes. And we also wanted to collect, um, to make sure that we were not um, um, inappropriately um, doing surgery on patients who then needed to have radiation afterwards. Uh, and again, vulvar cancer quality indicators, same sort of thing multiple MDT um, discussion. Uh, obviously, sentinel nodes is a big area here. And so those sorts of things, did the sentinel nodes, were they appropriate to have a sentinel node procedure? Was it a successful procedure? Was the pathology um, adequately processed and reported if it was a sentinel node procedure, margins, um, adverse events, and then obviously growing recurrence is an important CQI. So, um, so what does the future hold for um, the National Gynae Oncology Registry? Well, one of the things that's going to happen in the future is personalized report cards. So every surgeon is going to get a record of his patients that are on at the registry um, and what his results are. And I'm sure there'll be some sort of comparison benchmark to other um, hospitals and other um, clinicians as well. Um, we obviously need to finesse the ovarian cancer module and we need to add in the patient reported outcomes and the rare tumors. Um, once our pilot study is finished with our endometrial mod module, we'll look back at those CQIs and see whether or not um, they need to, to be finessed. And we obviously need to pilot the cervix and vulvar cancer modules as well. Um, we're in discussions with the Scottish group and the Dutch group who already have their own um, clinical quality registries. The Scottish have kind of had theirs developed since about, um, I think, 2013. And we actually um, relied quite heavily on um, theirs as a template. And they've got some um, um, really interesting data that they collect and have shared with us as well, and, and which is available um, publicly as well. Um, and we've just been in uh, discussions with the Dutch group as well. The Dutch group are really keen to harmonize international, some uh, international um, CQIs so that we can compare uh, cross country. 
and look it would be really great um if we could collaborate with the canadians because they're my preferred um collaborators and um and work together with you guys to see if uh, if you can um, come up with something like this as well if you think it's appropriate so i'll just go back to the personalized report cards because i just remember that i did actually ex uh, put a, an example up so this is fake data so this is this is not me um or nor is it anybody because we haven't actually developed this um but what you would get is you would get an overview of um data completeness for your patients how many patients you put in uh how many opted out primary site of tumor um you know something about the histology stage of diagnosis um grade uh genetic testing outcome, um, something about your surgery and what you did, um, extent of residual disease, um, and uh, what, what kind of surgery you did, um, something about your operative adverse events, um, and um, something about chemotherapy as well. So, um, so all interesting um, information. Um, so I think that might be all I have to say. What are we doing? Uh, so we've got um, we've got a few minutes left, on it, but I don't really think there's. Oh, obviously I need to make my acknowledgement. So this is uh, Rob Rome, and I I describe him as a dog with a bone. He just did not give up. He was the one that went and out and got the initial funding that allowed us to um, to to start off with our pilot project, um, and he uh, collaborated with the. Uh, John Salzberg, who is our academic lead, um, who was instrumental in setting up the prostate cancer registry and the lung cancer registry in Victoria. Um, and together, Rob and John uh, put together the grant that uh, allowed us to get 3.5 million from the uh, federal government to, um, to progress the second part of the uh, uh, of the clinical quality registry um, and listed there are all the working group chairs who have worked hard to get all the um, clinical quality indicators for um, various other areas. Um, honestly, this is like everything. The doctors have the great ideas, but it's other people that do the work. And that's obviously the data managers at all our sites who've worked tirelessly to put data in. And then our patients as well, for whom a very few percentage have decided to opt out of all of this. So um, we're obviously very grateful to them to allow this to continue. And I think that is now it.